closing lecture for us. Well, I'm going to talk about um, uh, some issues in concerning the Selmer Group for elliptic curves, but let me first say that it's really quite startling for me to to be at this winter school and to see so many eager and wonderful students. Um, when I was a graduate student, even Salva theory was a tiny subject. Um, um, Ibasawa had a couple of graduate students. Um, the only thing to study, really, uh, um, was Ibasawa's own papers. Maybe eight or ten papers would have been enough, more than enough. Um, and um, but now things have changed dramatically, and uh, just coming to the winter school and seeing what's going on um, is just one demonstration of that fact. Um, well, so I'm going to uh, assume P is an odd prime and gamma is, as usual, in these lectures, the Gattel group of Q infinity over Q or Q infinity. I'm just setting up some notation. Q infinity is the union of Q ends the cyclotomic ZP extension of Q. So the Q sub ends are, as you know, um, cyclic extensions of Q of degrees P to the N. And the Gallo group gamma is uh, isomorphic to ZP. It's an inverse limit of those cyclic groups of order P to the N. And uh, so then let's form a, a ring, lambda, ZP double bracket gamma. And uh, I often like to just think of it that way uh, as an um, abstract object, just the inverse limit of the finite group rings, the group rings for the finite groups, the Gallo groups of Q sub n over Q. But um, lambda is also isomorphic to a, a formal power series ring in a variable T. And one can think of T um, as corresponding to gamma minus 1, where gamma is a topological generator for capital gamma. And with this notation, um, suppose x is a finitely generated lambda module. Then um, I, this observation came up probably a number of times in the lectures. Uh, if x modulo tx is 0, then it follows that x is equal to 0. It's a consequence of Nakayama's lemma. Uh, the ring lambda is a, a local ring. And T is in the maximum ideal. The maximum ideal is generated by P and T. Um, but the module that I'm interested in looking at, I call, do you know it this way? Xe of Q infinity, which is where we can look at the sum of group for E over Q infinity, the P primary subgroup, and the Pontryagin dual of that. And so that's, in fact, a finitely generated lambda module. Um, not always, until I add some assumptions, not all, always a, a torsion lambda module. Um, and so if I look at, I can translate this remark from Nakayama's lemma um, into a statement about the Selmer group. And let me um, just drop the E. E will be fixed. And the statement I want to make is that if you look at the sum group over Q infinity, which is a lambda module, and you look at the kernel multiplication by T, that's actually the Pontryagin door of um, 
of um, x e q infinity modulo t times that module. And so if that's zero, then that's sufficient to say that the sum group of e over q infinity itself is zero. I'm going to drop the e, but since I wrote it here, I wrote it right here again. Um, So then, um, let me assume, oh, I want to make one more remark. Um, this assumption here, the kernel multiplication by t is simply, we could look at it this way, it's the gamma invariance um, for the sum group over q infinity. And so if that is vanishes, then the summer group itself vanishes. But now let's um, add to that picture the control theorem. So let me assume, just to simplify uh, a number of things, that, that the p-torsion, if you look at the moore delve group 3 over q and the p-torsion, let me assume that that's zero. That just uh, simplifies a number of things. Uh, it simplifies the statement of Mazur's control theorem that um, you can relate the summer group for E over Q. I'm always talking about the P primary subgroup to the summer group for E over Q infinity, the gamma invariance, but there will be a discrepancy in general, and I'm just going to call that the co kernel of the restriction map. The restriction map being um, this map here. Um, so we can do this in general, but things become quite nice if you assume E has good ordinary reduction. At P. Then, as has been proved, um, uh, Chris proved uh, this in his lectures that the kernel, well, the kernel is zero and the co-kernel is actually finite. And not only that, but um, Chris gave basically a formula for the co-kernel. And um, the remark I want to make right now is that um, uh, Xe Q infinity has no non-zero finite lambda modules, lambda submodules. This is a very, very useful property. I'm going to um, make use of it, but um, I'd better say that um, this is a tricky question if you change Q uh, to a finite extension, if you look at the cyclotomic ZP extension of a finite extension of Q, then this nice property is not always true. There are all examples, unfortunately, where you have non-trivial finite submodules um, in this situation. So then the statement becomes the following. The sum of group for E over Q infinity is either zero or infinite. Because this Pontryagin dual um, could very well be zero, but if it's but it can't be finite. So let me make um, two remarks. Um, if the sum group is infinite, well, there are two things to ask about that. Uh, so my first remark is just this standard exact sequence that if you look at the moore del group tensor with QP mod ZP, the moore del group for the elliptic curve over Q infinity, Turns out um, that um, 
that that's um, the Moore Del Vey group is a finitely generated group, actually, and just like uh, over a finite extension of Q. So this goes into the Selmer group for E over Q infinity, the P primary subgroup, and then we have a map to the Tate Safarevich group over Q infinity, the P primary subgroup, and zero. So if the Selmer group uh, over Q infinity is infinite, well, either the Moore Del Vey group contribution is infinite, which means that the rank, that there actually are points of infinite order on the elliptic curve over Q infinity, or the Tate Safarevich group is infinite. And both cases occur in examples. There are many examples where the Moore Del Vey contribution is zero. And so interesting, the the Selmer group can still be infinite, and the Tate Safarevich group would be infinite. That happens. I mean, all cases happen. You can have a combination of the two, or the contribution, the Selmer group may be entirely coming from the Moore Del Vey contribution. The Tate Safarevich group com com contribution can be zero. And um, the second remark I want to make. Uh, is that uh, it's the theorem of Cato and Warlick um, that uh, this module, um, and this is for the good ordinary case, I'm, which I'm assuming, is in fact a finitely generated torsion lambda module. And um, so Cato's contribution um, was to get an annihilator, a piatic L function, annihilates the module. And Roy's contribution was prove, to prove non-vanishing results about L values, and therefore that annihilator is not zero. Um, but what this means um, from the classification theorem or um, various, the various ways to justify this, it means that the Selmer group over Q infinity for the elliptic curve um, as a group is isomorphic to a direct sum of a finite number of copies of QP mod ZP, direct product with a group of bounded exponent. And these are building groups, of course, a group of bounded exponent. And uh, so the first factor is just the maximal divisible subgroup of the Selmer group over Q infinity. And um, I'm going to call this lambda E, the lambda invariant. And that's an interesting uh, invariant to look at. But this group of bounded exponent can actually be infinite. I'm going to give an example of that later. Um, it can't be finite, though, because if it were finite, then the Pontryagin door x e q infinity would have a, a finite lambda submodule. And so this group of bounded exponent is actually either zero or infinite. And I'm not going to be precise, but there's a mu invariant, which one can, um, which describes the structure of this more precisely. And the mu invariant. Um, um, is equal to zero if and only if, um, well, I could say it this way, the Selmer group over Q infinity is divisible. So this second uh, factor is not, uh, is zero. Um, and actually, um, in terms of the characteristic ideal, um, the mu invariant is simply uh, the, the power p. p to the mu e is the power p that divides in the ring lambda, uh, a generator of the characteristic ideal. And lambda e is actually the number of zeros of, of a generator of the characteristic ideal, counting the multiplicities. So the questions you can ask um, um, are, um, 
if the Selma group is infinite, is it the Moore Del Rey group or the Tate Safarovich group, or both? That's one question. The other question is if the Selma group is infinite, is it because lambda is, in, is positive? Or um, could it be that the contribution, what makes it infinite, is that the mu invariant is positive? Um, now I have to figure out. Where to, oh, yes, okay. So the question I want to talk about, and this is really the theme of my talk, is um, when is the Salmon group for E over Q infinity not zero, and therefore infinite, as I remarked before. And um, so I don't know, is the control theorem still? Um, Okay, let me write down the control theorem again. The Selmer group for E over Q maps to the Selmer group for E over Q infinity. Gamma invariance maps to um, the co-kernel. So of course, um, there are some fairly obvious situations where the Selmer group over Q infinity will be non-zero, um, namely, um, they all be the rank of the Mordell Vey group for E over Q. And if R is positive, then um, um, I think it's still where, if I look at remark one over there, um, if the rank is positive, then when I tensor with QP mod ZP, I get. QP mod ZP is mapped injectively at QP mod ZP to the R. That would be the f first term in uh, that remark one. And that's mapped um, to, um, into the Selma group for E over Q, which is mapped into the Selma group for E over Q infinity gamma invariance. And obviously, it's mapped into the maximal divisible subgroup. Well, so it goes into the summer group for E over Q infinity, and actually into the maximal divisible subgroup. So that means that lambda sub E, as I've defined it, is at least R. And that will make the summer group infinite. Um, Um, but a more subtle thing which would make the Selma group infinite, perhaps um, R is zero. So that's an interesting case. And of course, uh, another obvious remark is maybe the Selma group over Q, uh, the P primary subgroup is not zero. Then that would again be an obvious situation where in the control theorem, um, the Selma group over Q is not zero and therefore um, the sum group over Q infinity will be non-zero and therefore infinite. But actually, there's an interesting uh, issue here. Um, the sum group for E over Q infinity will be infinite, but is it the more del V part or the tate Ravitch part? And um, in fact, it could be either, because one um, phenomenon which happens, you could have um, the rank equal to zero over Q. And the Tate-Safrovic group might be um, a non-trivial finite group. But maybe the more del Vey group over Q1, the first layer, is positive. And so what can happen um, is that the Tate-Safrovic group could become trivial. Um, it could land in, in under the restriction map in the more del Vey contribution to the summer group over that large field of that field Q1. And this phenomenon is kind of um, what one might call a visibility phenomenon where elements of Shah can actually be seen as elements in some more del Vey group. 
Um, so in fact, um, in this case, either phenomenon could happen. It could be the Mordell Vey group or the Tate Salford Ravis group for the Salmon group over Q infinity, which, which is infinite. Um, Okay, but now let's consider the possibility that the sum of group over Q is equal to zero, which certainly happens. But then the co-kernel, in the control theorem, we have this co-kernel, which could be non-trivial, and, and one can uh, compute its order. And so one finds, um, and this comes from um, things like Chris proved, um, um, In this case, the Selmer group for E over Q infinity is not zero. Um, that's equivalent to saying that the co-kernel is not zero, which means that P divides some Tamagawa factor, CL, for some L dividing the conductor of the elliptic curve, but not equal to P. Or another possibility, uh, using the notation that uh, Chris used, alpha p might be congruent to one modulo p. You remember, in the valuation of one minus alpha p comes into the order of the co-kernel in a certain way. And uh, this is a phenomenon which, um, the fact that this congruence, I'm not going to really say anything about the first divisibility, um, and for a given elliptic curve, there are only finitely many primes, but that can happen. But for a given elliptic curve, there are probably infinitely many primes. Um, well, I think it might depend. Um, but at least for many elliptic curves, there should be infinitely many primes where this happens. Now, um, I'm assuming the elliptic curve has a uh, good ordinary reduction. And if you look at the FP points on the reduced elliptic curve, the order of that group is given by a formula like this, 1 plus P minus A sub P, where A sub P is the P Fourier coefficient in the modular form that uh, corresponds to E. But one can also write this as 1 minus alpha P times 1 minus beta P, where alpha P is... Uh, periodic unit and beta p has valuation one. And, um, and so alpha p congruent to one mod p means that um, uh, p divides, well, I could say it this way, e tilde, if you look at the fp points on the reduced elliptic curve, and the, the points of order P, then that's not zero. There would have to be a point of order P. And another way to say this is that um, A sub P is congruent to one modulo P. Okay. Um. And the terminology that uh, Mazur used for this is we then say P is anomalous. For E. And another remark I should make is that since AP is bounded, there's a well-known V bound, two squared of P on the absolute value of AP. If it's congruent to one, then it's actually equal to one. Um, except at least if P is greater than five, it would, that would, it would have to be equal to one. Okay. And just one more word about uh, this anomalous situation. Um, uh, another way to describe it is that if you look at E bracket P, so there's a map to E tilde bracket P, just reduction modulo P, 
and that map is surjective, and there's a kernel, um, which I'm going to um, just call F sub E bracket P right now. It, I'm going to introduce the formal group for the elliptic curve in a couple of minutes, and um, that's why I'm writing this, the elements of order P on the formal group. And uh, this becomes, so this is an obvious exact sequence, but in the anomalous case, um, it becomes uh, this exact sequence. E bracket P goes to Z mod PZ with the trivial action. Now this is all for the action, I should say this, this is for um, the action of GQP, the local Gato group over QP. And the kernel, well, the kernel will be isomorphic to mu P, the p roots of unity, as um, for the action of GQP. So we would have this exact sequence in the anomalous case. And um, so this is a situation where um, this implies, because the co-kernel would then be non-trivial, it implies that the summer group for E over Q infinity is infinite. It's not zero and therefore infinite. But then you can ask the question, is it the Mordell of A contribution to the Selma group or the tate safarevich contribution? You can ask that question. But you can also ask, is it the Lambda invariant or the mu invariant, um, which is positive? And actually, both cases occur. And what I'm going to describe now is um, a situation where the mu invariant is positive. And uh, I think one thing that makes that interesting is that uh, I imagine um, Professor Coates mentioned this. Um, for the um, classical Ibasawa module, the inverse limit of um, P parts of ideal class groups in the cyclotomic ZP extension, there's a long, a great conjecture that the mu invariant is zero. Um, and this has been proved by Ferrero and Washington um, in the case of an abelian ground field. Um, but in an elliptic curve case, we can have this phenomenon. And um, so one can ask, is there a, any conjecture reminiscent of the conjecture that one has in classical Ibasawa theory? So let me discuss this. And um, I want to consider a situation Um, suppose that we have an exact sequence zero goes to mu p goes to e bracket p goes to z mod p z goes to zero an exact sequence but now for the action, what? Oh, mu p, yeah, mu p. Thank you. For the action of the global Gato group T Q. So of course that would bring us to the anomalous situation because we would then have that exact sequence for the local Gato group. The Salma group would have to be infinite. Um, what? Hmm? Was mu e the standard experiment? No, no, um, I'm sorry. Um, my notation is there's a slight conflict. Mu e was uh, a certain integer, but mu p here is the p roots of unity. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to give an example now where mu e is greater than zero. So mu e was a measure of the um, this. Uh, group of bounded exponent. When I wrote the sum of group as a direct sum of a divisible group and uh, another group which was a group of bounded exponents, um, I probably should have said, but let me say now that if mu e is positive, it means that that group is infinite. 
but it has bounded exponents. So that means that there are infinitely many elements of order p. So by saying that mu is positive is equivalent to saying that there are infinitely many elements of order p. Um, the divisible subgroup can only contribute a finite number of elements of order p. And so um, I'm going to give you an example now. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it, um, some diff I didn't really want to um, be too precise about that, but um, in, in some cases it could be the exponent, but you could have two, f I'll get, just write down two examples. Um, you could have lambda mod p squared lambda for the Pontryagin dual. Then the exponent is p squared, and that's the mu invariant. Or you could have lambda p cross lambda p. Lambda p, lambda cross lambda p, lambda. In both cases, the mu invariant is 2. Yeah. OK. Um, so anyway, now I'm supposing that we have this exact sequence. In other words, I'm assuming here that the elliptic curve is an isogeny of degree p over q. And the kernel of that isogeny is isomorphic to mu p for the action of the Gallo group. And um, so let me try to um, um, I'm going to write it a little bit differently. Um, uh, I'm assuming that we have um, an exact sequence Zero goes to phi, goes to E bracket P, goes to psi, goes to zero where phi as a Gadwell module is isomorphic to mu P. And, um, and let me now give you an argument um, uh, to say that in that case, the mu invariant will be positive. And now let me um, bring in again the formal group. I'm going to let F sub B be the formal group. Formal group attached to a minimal model for the elliptic curve. And so then um, uh, one can write down this exact sequence. The QP bar points on the elliptic curve, we could uh, reduce modulo P and we get the FP bar points on the reduced elliptic curve, and that map is surjective. And the kernel will be um, the points on the formal group over um, QP bar, but let me write M bar referring to the maximum ideal in the ring of integers of QP bar. That's where, um, so that's, as well known, the kernel of the reduction map. And um, now in this case, the height of the formal group is equal to 1. And let me um, look at the p-power torsion points on all of these um, things. Um, so I can write down this exact sequence. On the formal group, we have the p power torsion points. And then on the elliptic curve, we have the p power torsion points. And we have this exact sequence mapping to the p power torsion points on the reduced elliptic curve. And um, as a group, the torsion on the elliptic curve, the p power torsion is isomorphic to a direct sum of two copies of QP mod ZP. But on the reduced elliptic curve, we have ordinary reduction. So this is isomorphic to one copy of QP mod ZP. And this is an exact sequence for the action of the local Gatto group, GQP. And on this thing, the action of GQP is unramified. ramified. 
And the Frobenius for P, the Frobenius acts by multiplication by alpha P. And on this part, this will be also isomorphic to QP mod ZP, the head of the formal group is one, but the action will be highly ramified. Um, when, if you restrict to the inertia group, the action will be uh, by the cyclotomic character. And um, so this has a bearing, um, and um, this was explained by, um, by Chris uh, in his lectures. This has a bearing on describing the Selmer group. The Selmer group for the elliptic curve, the Selmer group for the elliptic curve over Q infinity could be described this way as the kernel for the, um, the relaxed Selmer group over Q infinity. So there we're just requiring uh, co-cycles to be unramified at all primes uh, except for P. And then um, I'll put it here. Then we map that to H uh, QP infinity. I'll use this notation for the cyclotomic ZP extension of Q of QP. Um, e bracket P infinity modulo Fe bracket P infinity. So this is uh, may, maybe a different notation, but this is um, um, the description of the local condition at P uh, defining the summer group in the case of good ordinary reduction. Um, this quotient, of course, is isomorphic to E tilde bracket P infinity. And we're basically looking at um, uh, H1 modulo H1F. It's, um, but maybe I should, let me just remark that we have this obvious exact sequ sequ sequence. Um, we can map that H1 into um, H1 QP infinity, um, E bracket P infinity. And, uh, and then um, to um, the H1 I have here, H1 QP infinity, E P infinity, modulo F sub E P infinity. And so, so the um, co-cycles which are trivial here are exactly the co-cycles which are the, in the image of this map from H1 with values in F E P infinity to H1 with values in E bracket P infinity. And the point of this remark is to, to describe the sum group for E over Q infinity is the set of all Co-cycle classes in the relaxed summer group. Rob, why is the first map in that last exact sequence uh, ejected? Um, why do you have the zero? Actually, okay, I don't really need the zero. Um, um, and um, okay, so that let me erase that zero, but but I don't need it because a remark I'm going to make is that the image of that first map is the kernel of the second map. So we're looking at the um, co-cycles in the relaxed summer group for Q infinity. And the uh, requirement is that sigma, the one co-cycle, well, there are many uh, one co-cycles that represent the same class, but um, all I need to say is that sigma is a one co-cycle with values in F E P infinity. So the co-cycle classes which have such a representative um, will be co-cycle satisfying the local condition at P. Um, um, so let me come back to the situation where I have this exact sequence 
E bracket P infinity, phi goes to E bracket P infinity, psi goes to zero. And these are, um, this is for the action of GQ, an exact sequence for the action of GQ. And, um, but phi is isomorphic to mu P infinity, to, to mu P, I'm assuming that, and therefore phi, well, if I look at the formal group, if I look at, um, so the action of um, the local Gato group on psi is trivial, and therefore unramified, the action on phi is ramified. And for that reason, you can see that phi is in the kernel reduction map. In other words, phi is contained in the points on the formal group of order P, and therefore contained in the points the p power points of p power order on the formal group. So therefore, um, if I have a co-cycle, um, um, what? Um, oh yes, okay. I certainly don't want that. That's right, yeah. That's right. So um, if I have an isogeny, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. So maybe you see where I'm going now, because now I'm going to use classical Kuma theory. Um, let me make the remark which comes out of what I'm saying here. I could look at H1. Um, I'm going to use the notation H1 relaxed over Q infinity for um, phi. And all I mean by that um, is I look at the co-cycles um, over Q infinity with values in phi which are unramified at all primes away from P. But that's mapped into Phi is a subgroup of E bracket P infinity. So that's mapped into, I'll use this notation, A1 relaxed over Q infinity with values in E bracket P, but I can put E bracket P infinity here. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, um, let me see. We have a map from here to here And, the, and I can put relax there because um, the co-cycles will still be, the image of a co-cycle here will still be unramified at all primes away from P. Um, but this is actually this, the relaxed summer group over Q infinity for the elliptic curve E. Just the co-cycles which are unramified at all primes away from P. And the map may not be injected, but it, it's not hard to see. It has a finite kernel. And, um, but if I look at cocycles with values in phi, and then look at them as cocycles with values in E bracket P infinity, they'll actually satisfy the summer condition. Um, oh, it's not um, showing here, but because phi is contained in the p power points in the formal group, sigma will have values there. And therefore, um, the local condition at primes, okay, I have to st stop uh, very soon. Just let me just finish this. Um, so in fact, I can leave out the relaxed here. And I get a contribution to the actual summer group. But now the key, and I'll just uh, write this down. If I look at the units, in Q infinity, just the ordinary algebraic number theory units in the ring of integers of Q infinity um, and tensor that with QP mod ZP. Well, that's mapped by just classical Kummer theory to um, H1 with values um, 
H1 over Q infinity with values in mu p, but I can put phi there because I can, phi is isomorphic to mu p. And now these co-cycles are gotten by um, taking, um, I'm sorry, I'm not writing the right thing. I want to look at u infinity mod u infinity to the p. That maps into H and H1 of q infinity with values in phi. And, uh, but these co-cycles will got, be gotten by taking p, p fruits of units. And therefore, they'll be actually unramified at all primes away from p. And, uh, and then the punchline is that this map that actually is injective. That's just classical Kummer theory. And furthermore, the image is actually because of my remarks in the Selmer group for E over Q infinity. The local condition at all primes is satisfying. And finally, this group has infinite dimension as a vector space over Z mod PZ, and that's what Coates proved, that as you go up the cyclotomic tower, the units at one level are direct sum end in the units at the next level. And so U infinity um, is roughly uh, a direct sum of copies of Z, and infinite number of copies of Z. Um, the rank is increasing because these are totally real number fields of increasing degree. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, one more remark. Um, this can be imitated uh, if you have an isogeny of degree phi, which is ramified and odd. You can imitate this argument. And if you do not have such an isogeny, then I think there's a good reason to believe uh, that the mu invariant is zero. So that would be the conjecture. Um, in particular, if E bracket P is reducible, irreducible, then it's reasonable to conjecture that the mu invariant is zero. Okay, now I'll stop. Um, Any questions? Yeah. So what happens if the elliptic curve doesn't have good ordinary reduction? Well, I was going to talk, that was my next topic. <laughs> um, um, so what, what John Coates and I prove is that um, it's still there on that board, the description of the Selmer group. Um, in the case of super singular reduction, good super singular reduction, it turns out we proved that that description is still valid. It's still valid, but in the um, super singular case, the points on the formal group are the same as the points on the elliptic curve, the p-power torsion, uh, because uh, on the reduced elliptic curve, there's no p-power torsion. So that means that, um, that every one co-cycle in the relaxed summer group satisfies the local condition at P. Uh, but as Chris pointed out um, in his talk, the relaxed summer group uh, has lambda co-rank. He might have been talking about the ordinary case, but this is true in general, that the relaxed summer group is Pontryagin dual has lambda rank one. So in that case, the summer group is the same as the relaxed summer group, and it would have lambda co-rank one, which means it's not lambda co-torsion. Um, but it's a, it's a rather non-trivial thing to prove that, that that is still a valid description of the Selmer group. Um, it uh, relies on proving a Hilbert theorem 90 for the formal group. Okay, any further questions? Ah. Thanks, Bryden. Um, I feel like what I've heard is that uh, you suggested at least the mu invariant is either zero, one, or two. Do you have like an explanation for that? Oh, oh um, well, I meant to. I 
meant to give you an actual example. Um, if you look at the elliptic curves of conductor 11, there are three um, elliptic curves. They're isogenous to each other. And two of those elliptic curves have a subgroup of an isogeny whose kernel is isomorphic to mu, mu p. And this will be equal to 5, I should say. Um, and so the mu invariant, um, one of those elliptic curves has two isogenies. And it turns out you can verify that the mu invariant is 1 for that elliptic curve. There's another elliptic curve with an isogeny of degree 25, um, which is, um, I would say, ramified and odd. And that elliptic curve has mu invariant at least 2, but in fact exactly 2. And the remaining elliptic curve um, uh, has a kernel, has an isogeny with kernel Z mod PZ, and, and just that isogeny. And, and the mu invariant can be verified to be zero for that elliptic curve. And in that, exam in that example, the lambda invariant is zero. And the subgroup, Selma group is precisely um, the, um, the group of bounded exponents. The divisible subgroup is zero. And um, now I think for the prime two, the mu invariant can in fact be larger. Um, and I think. Um, it all depends on the isogenies that exist. And for the prime three now, I don't remember whether um, there's an elliptic curve with um, an appropriate isogeny, a cyclic isogeny of degree 27. Um, I can't recall right now, but that would be the issue um, to get an example where the mu invariant is um, large. I forget for the prime two um, how big the new invariant can be, but it can be uh, fairly big, I think, maybe eight, like that. Um. Uh, so is it, do you conjecture that it's always true that in any isogeny class, there's one that, ha at least one that has mu invariant zero? Yeah, that would be um, actually equivalent to the conjecture I made before, um, that, um, that you can always find uh, at least one elliptic curve in any given isogeny class over Q with zero mu invariant. And then it turns out that all the other mu invariants can be computed um, in a fairly simple way. And it agrees with, and basically the, the upside is that this type of construction appears to be the only way to create a positive mu invariant. Um, oh, yes, okay, that's another remark. Um, um, it is false over a number of fields that you can um, produce isogeny classes uh, where all the mu invariants are positive um, over a certain number of fields and for certain elliptic curves. You can produce uh, situations where the mu invariant is always positive. Um, but then what happens is when you induce the Galois module, to Q, getting a Gadol module isomorphic to um, with a ZP co rank two times the degree, uh, the mu invariant can still be killed by finding um, a suitable um, Gadol submodule um, in that thing. In other words, uh, applying an isogeny to that Gadol module. That, that would be a reasonable uh, conjecture. Um. Okay, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. And maybe I should add that this is really um, a great uh, conference or um, winter school. I had a good time. I hope everyone did. Thank you.